in this? I, uh, I went put her by the coffee pot down in Bruno. I don't want you to get a short in back. No, it'll be all right. It'll, it'll well, boil off. <clears throat> okay, today is uh, June 24th, 2008. We are at the uh, Buffalo uh, Erie County Historic Society, and we are interviewing uh, Mr. Harry Kuligowski. Harry J. Kuligowski. Um, the interviewer is Wayne Clark. Mr. Kuligowski, for the record, please state your full name and your date and place of birth. Harry J. Kuligowski, 21520, Amtrak, Michigan. Okay. And whereabouts did you go to school? I've gone through uh, junior high, which is Copernicus, the great astronaut, and then fulfilled the graduation in uh, Amtramic High. And Hamtramck is named after a French colonel during the colonial occupation forces in Michigan. Okay, and... Uh, as a matter of fact, the school is no longer there. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, if you've ever seen the Indian on a horse with the tears rolling down his eyes to see as to what happened to his reservation, I happen to be his great-great-nephew because the city of Detroit today is in shambles. Hiroshima and Nagasaki are in better shape than the city of Detroit is. Okay. Uh, do you remember where you were when you heard about uh, Pearl Harbor? Pearl Harbor happened to be Sunday morning. Just came back from Sunday service in church. Okay. And that was on uh, 2381 Holmes Avenue, Hamtramck, Michigan. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> when and where did you enter the service? Well, my oldest brother was one of the first to go into the service. As a matter of fact, he was with the 8th Air Force, 819 Avi Aviation Engineer Battalion. And uh, he got Shanghai. And uh, being that the oldest brother was there, I figured I was going to go help him fight the war. Little did I realize at the time that it took 16 million people to fight the war, not just the kid brother helping the older brother. Uh, they Shanghai into England because they laid the mats and landing fields for the planes that were supposed to land in, in England. And uh, I took it upon myself to parents wouldn't sign, they figured war was hell the way it was. Mm -hmm. Of course, as a young kid, I was very much impressed with the idea during World War I that mother's two brothers were in World War I. One was an artillery sergeant, and the other one was a machine gunner. And as a kid, you always go for the glory of five things of being a machine gunner. Until I found out what a machine gun weighs and what it takes to carry it. Mm -hmm. Forget it. Different ideas, different changes. But, Excuse uh, me, uh, do you want that door shut? With, with a little bit of a noise on the side, I think, will make it a little more realistic. Okay, now, uh, where and when did you enter the service yourself? Uh, about July 1st, Battle Creek, Michigan, 1942. Okay, and uh, you enlisted, you, you weren't drafted? Well, indirectly, I enlisted, but being that the parents did not want to sign, figuring that there were three boys, one mm -hmm. the oldest was already in, and I figured I was going to help my oldest brother win the war, which I found out that it takes more than just two people. Mm -hmm. I made some connections with the draft board and had them slip my name up front where the parents wouldn't give the consent and sign it. And had the paperwork come in there where, as a young fellow, okay. I was able to make connections. Of course, like this young fellow here said, he regretted. I didn't regret. It's an experience that money can't buy yet. If you had the money, money can't buy no part of it. Okay. It's priceless. And whereabouts did you go for your training? We went to Battle Creek, Michigan. As a matter of fact, to be able to be shipped out from the point of debarkation, they had to give you all GI clothes, government issue. Mm -hmm. I wore a seven and a half civilian shoe at the time. They gave me a size 12. Otherwise, they couldn't move you. I was the only private that was able to do an about face with the shoes still pointing in the same direction. <laughs> You've seen those cartoons, but I was one of them. And they told me that when I got to the point of destination, they were going to go to the quartermaster and exchange it. Okay. Matter of fact, it took about six weeks. I had more than one sergeant curse me up and down. So here I said about face. I did about face, but my shoes were still pointing in the wrong direction. And, and where was the destination? Uh, Camps with Texas. Okay. Was that your first time away from home? Well, we did some traveling to New York because my mother recently came from the state of New York. Mm -hmm and uh, had villages just on the outskirts of the state of New York, of uh, Michigan, but uh, a distance away foreign country, yes, like going to Europe, whatever the case may be, yes. Okay, and what was basic training like for you? 
18 weeks of hell. Mm -hmm. Because then you had the regular army people, people that couldn't make a go of life, being it was during the Depression years. They let you know that, and they said to squat, they wanted you to squat, mm -hmm. and no ifs or buts about it. It isn't like today. If your son goes into the service and you mistreat the soldier, he calls his mother, she calls the senator or the congressman and says, Sir, my son is not accustomed to that sort of handling mm -hmm. or maintenance. And uh, you didn't familiarize with yourself. The idea with the World War II enlistees, which were the drill instructors, never wanted to get friendly with you because they said, we are here to train you. We are here to, tr to teach you how to destroy or kill your enemy and not have the enemy kill you. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a new experience. I mean, you were born during the Depression years. Mm -hmm. You didn't have much, but you made the best of what there was. You adjusted accordingly. Child ingenuity, you made your own play toys. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that difficult. Okay. And being brought up by a wonderful family, a strict Catholic family, uh, the thing they bestowed upon you was respectability. You respected authority. It came easy. Okay. Once you graduated from basic, uh, where did you go from there? Uh, from there, we went down to. Well, let, let's get let, let's get the story with those shoes. As a matter of fact, the chaplain said to me, "Son, what's your problem?" When I told him about the shoes, he told me and wrote up the name, and told me to let the first sergeant know the following morning he'd go on sick call. He put you in the ambulance, took you four miles, seven miles out the quartermasters, exchanged shoes, missing breakfast, and told you to put these shoes on, which were seven and a half, civilian size, walk back to your barracks and break the shoes in. Well, you can imagine what anxiety and torture that was. Mm -hmm. Because there were blisters on top of blisters with the shoes not fitting properly. So then we went to Fort Sam Houston, and then when they found out this tenderfoot was not to be for the infantry, I got in into 379th Infantry, the 3rd Battalion Headquarters Company for the anti-tank platoon because the infantry was for the tough guys. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens that this tender foot was not able to keep up with it. From there we went for desert training to California. And after desert training, uh, we came back to uh, Camp uh, Indian Town Camp. Oh, Pennsylvania. Getting, in Pennsylvania, getting ready for shipping overseas. Because after D-Days, they were looking for, at the time, they used reinforcement, uh, replacements. And then they found out technically, psychologically, you do not replace a dead one. Terminology was reinforcements are more practical. Mm -hmm. Made you feel proud that you're reinforcing an organization. But theoretically speaking, it was a replacement. You're replacing a dead one. Okay. And when did you go overseas? Uh, about two or three weeks after D-Day, and uh, went on the SS West Point, had some submarines chases across the Atlantic Ocean, we got random, landed in England, got into one of the stables they had for horses, because England itself, if they had any more troops or equipment on it, it was sent, because the island itself, half of the world, the United States was in, in England, mm -hmm. getting ready for preparatory for the uh, invasion of, of Normandy, and uh, we only stayed there for a short period of time. As a matter of fact, I remember the first B-1s and B-2s that came over. You're familiar with the B-1s and mm -hmm. B-2s. Yep. The majority of people aren't aware of what a B-1 and B-2 was. I mean, there's a ton, ton and a half of ammunition. You could hear them, pop, 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 and the next thing when that motor shut off, you knew in a matter of seconds, she blew. And of course, the other thing was there that uh, the English lost an awful lot of soldiers up in England uh, when they made the invasion of France, the Dunkirk invasion, they lost an awful lot of troops there. Mm -hmm. Of course, they were at war for a couple of years before we got in. And uh, also, Chamberlain or Churchill was aware of the fact that Hawaii was supposed to have been bombed, but he never let the United States government know about it. This all came out later out in the source of information because he wanted the United States to be involved in the war. Because the majority of Americans at the time figured World War I was enough. We did not want to get involved in World War II. So uh, we hit St. Lo. You're familiar with St. Lo mm -hmm. in France. Yep. And uh, 
after we... Now, what, what unit did, were you placed in at that point? We were still with the 95th Infantry Division, 379th Infantry, 3rd Battalion, Headquarters Company. Okay. And after I got wounded the second time, they figured the war was coming pretty close to an end because we went through the Maginot Line, the Fred Siegfried Line, and uh, we got in onto the uh, Battle of Metz. Are you familiar with Metz? Mm -hmm. Well, let's go back a little bit to the first time you were wounded. Uh, do you want to talk about how? how not really, because like I say, to me this is past. This, this is something that will not cure or replace any the inconveniences or the unpleasantries that were with it. I mean, it was an artillery barrage. Mm -hmm. uh, you've seen a lot of these people that were blown to smotherings. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, when I use the word reinforcement rather than replacement, uh, the age of 38 was where the majority of the Americans were not taken in after 38 years of age. They figured they were too old for service. Although we did have them come in there with trigger finger missing. And the first thing they want to know, uh, what do you do in the event of an attack? Well, there isn't a manual written, technical-wise, that'll tell you what to do in the event of an attack. Practical experience tells you what to do. You know what I mean? Okay. Common sense. Sometimes that does, sometimes it doesn't. If your number's on it, there ain't a damn thing you can do. Matter of fact, we had two replacements, what they call reinforcements. One was 38, one was 41 that they brought in as reinforcements. Mm -hmm. And this one fellow had three children. He asked me, what do you do in the case of an attack? Well, normally the common sense tells you if the enemy is throwing shells into your end of the combat zone, you move up towards their lines because they're not going to destroy their own troops. Mm -hmm. As we were talking, the artillery shells burst. This one fellow had his arm blown off. He picked it up and he says, I'm hit, I'm hit, and he's trying to put his arm back on. I mean, these things that are unpleasant that you don't want to, sure. you don't want to indulge in. All right, well. Then the other one, a shell hit him and his intestinal tract fell out. He was trying to pick up his intestinal tracts. He says, I've got four children. Help me, help me, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And these things you don't forget, you don't, you don't get away with them. I mean, it's, it's there, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then during the course of the time, we liberated Buchenwald, which was a camp, concentration camp. And after what you've seen in a concentration camp, you have a different outlook of what life is all about. It's cheap and different. Mm -hmm. It's worthless of what they actually did to the human element in Europe. So after I got wounded, the second time as you were trying to ask me for questions, it's so just involved that... Uh, well, let me, let me just ask you this. How, how long were you hospitalized for? We weren't. They put a bandage on you and you stayed right at the front line. Mm -hmm. Because basically, the German element was, it's easier to wound a soldier than it is to kill him. If you kill him, he lays dead. If you wound a soldier, it takes four or five people, the medics, the paramedics, pick you up, aid station, the doctors and nurses. They were using the technology of putting more pressure on the services rather than just destroying them. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Kill them. Okay. If a dead one talks not. A dead one does not need any assistance. So the idea and philosophy in Germany was wound a soldier, don't kill him, don't destroy him. Mm -hmm. So after being wounded the second time, they figured the war was coming to an end. This is when they had trouble with the Germans during the winter months where they're trying to invade Stalingrad, Leningrad, and the Russians came through with all those tanks that the Mink and uh, drove the Germans back. Mm -hmm. It just so happened that uh, in the Arlington Force, uh, the one thing I could say is this, the phone lines, the civilian phone lines, were not destroyed. They, anybody in, in France or Germany can pick up the phone and talk to Berlin, Bonn, or anyplace else <laughs> just by getting out of the phone, Achtung, Achtung, and speak to an officer or a German general mm -hmm. and say the Americans are here, the Americans are there, this is what the situation is. I mean, you talk about outlook. There was a, we learned all these things after the war was over. As a matter of fact, I enjoy more watching the History Channel, knowing where the hell I was at, what we were encountering, what were our ambitions were, and what our, our, our uh, commitments were, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because everything was on a QT, because they didn't want the enemy to know as to what the operations were. Mm -hmm. So, when this woman was picked up, they brought her into G2, and she was trying to tell them that the Germans were bringing in anywhere from 12 to 15 trains a day from the Russian front. They were getting ready for the Battle of the Bulge. But the Americans sat back and said, the Germans have nothing. It's just a matter of time before the war's going to be over with. Little they get fooled. Mm -hmm. You got an 80-mile front line that they came through, and we lost more people at the Battle of the Bulge than we did actually in the invasion of Normandy. And we lost about 3,000 in Normandy invasion, and they landed at the wrong place. As a matter of fact, there's a standing joke down there where the Americans, where they were supposed to land, didn't land in the point, no matter what they're supposed to, they landed 
a given amount of miles away from the point. As a matter of fact, last year they had some of the Americans visiting the Normandy beachhead, and they had some of the English people down there. Some of the Americans were viewing the Normandy beachhead, and they asked the English chap where the English, I mean, where, where the, the American uh, beaches were at Normandy. And they said, you Americans did not know 65 years ago what's the, what the land, and you do not know where it is now, do you? It's a standard joke, supposedly. But in reality, I was confronted after the second wound, hit by a sniper that brought me in to military police. And at the time, they figured the war was coming to an end. And what they were concerned about was to get all these people from the concentration camps to find out other point of origin when they brought them in from Russia, Poland, Hungary, Slovenia. And if you were able to speak the language, you know, like Latin is a basic language for French, Italian, Spanish, Polish, more or less a basic language for Slovak, Czechoslovakian, the Poles, a little bit of Russian. And I was confronted with, would you like to join the CIC, which is a civilian interrogation corps. In other words, they've had thousands and thousands of people in these concentration camps. Mm -hmm. And to get any information from them, they had to have interpreters. And if you were able to encounter them and speak their language, you at least find out as to where their homeland was at. Mm -hmm. But they were able to take the literature on. Of course, we couldn't feed them. They were starved. And any food that you gave, like a candy bar, they were so highly concentrated that they'd run into a diarrhea. The food that we ate, too concentrated. They would die from the food that you try to feed them. So in reality, you'd have to find out who these people are, where they are. Of course, like I said, after being out to the front line, I got the opportunity to get the military government of the CIC. I'd be a fool if I didn't take the opportunity, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So, so that's how you got involved with G2. That's right. Well, G2 is General Patton. He's the guy mm -hmm. that says, go get them. Mm -hmm. His words were, those SOBs aren't worth a dime. He said, the only German is, is a dead one. He was, he was a general. And then your reality, as you said, about uh, MacArthur being uh, fired, basically he wasn't fired. He was relieved of his duties by President Truman. Mm -hmm. There was a general that wanted to fight a billion Chinamen plus the Russians, which were involved in Korea. So nationally, we were interviewing the people that had come to mm -hmm. different places. As a matter of fact, when we had a group of people that I had to take back to the Polish border, the Russians would, would encounter us and stop us at the border and would not let us go any further than that. Of course, the Americans made the mistake, too, of the invasion money we printed for the American soldiers, and they had the same invasion plate made handed to the Russians. The only difference was we had a dot, the Russians didn't have it. Anything they can put their hands on, they bought anything and everything, any GI clothes or equipment that you had, they would confiscate it. It was our American money that was being backed up by it. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, in Czechoslovakia, when I had an interview to do, uh, the Germans did an awful lot of raping in Russia. And the Russians, in turn, were going to do the same thing to retaliate to the German women in Berlin and all. As a matter of fact, when we liberated Czechoslovakia, uh, one of the Russians were trying to rape a couple of women down here. Of course, like a good American and humanitarian, I tried to intercede by telling them, hey, back off, man, you know what I mean? And uh, I damn near almost left myself as fertilizer in, 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 in uh, Czechoslovakia because he threatened me in Russian that he was going to blow my brains out. Do not interfere. Of course, at the time, we weren't aware of the fact that we should have gone into Berlin proper. That's when they had the Berlin air airlift. Mm -hmm. They only had 20 miles of airlift with our airplanes, and we lost all those planes, and the cost of money bringing in food, milk, coal for the Germans. And as most honorable President Kennedy said, I am a Berliner. That went over big, you remember that statement. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just so happened then that we had to take people back. I was basically, when the Battle of the Balls broke out, I was in Luxembourg proper. And that was at 6 o'clock in the morning on the 80 mile front where the Russians brought in all their equipment and everything else, broke through an 80 mile front. And man, they raised holy hell the American troops. As a matter of fact, you were speaking to the 98th Division, the 99th Division just came in stateside. And they were green. And they had them so far apart that all the Germans had to get in on Holmes, Achtung, Achtung, Amerikanisch, meaning an American soldier, a quarter mile here, outpost, two miles, two soldiers there. The lines were thin. It was like going through to uh, paper, toilet paper. Because they were under the impression, as a matter of fact, the 82nd Airborne gets an awful lot of glory, but in reality, they didn't go through hell. 
But the 82nd Airborne were in Paris getting wine dined, laid and tattooed when they were brought in for the Battle of the Bulge. I was in at the Battle of the Bulge deal. As a matter of fact, one thing to this day, if I smell something like meat or flesh burning, I get a nausea. Because the American tanks, uh, the tanks that we had down there, just like toys, the, the German Mark IV, Mark Vs, and even the tanks that the Russians had down there with the 88s on it, when they hit, that was it. And uh, like I say, it, it, it's something that you don't go back 65 years, get the same emotions and same feelings that you had at the time. Mm -hmm. You were younger, you were more gullible, you know what I mean? You knew no better. You, know, you, you have more value, more principle in life today. And when you get to be a teenager of 88, I want to live until I die, and I'll never get to die. Like I say, I've been active. So in reality, after being at the Battle of the Bulls, uh, we were supposed to be scheduled to come back stateside. I had an older brother that was there for five years. He got shipped back stateside. And I had another brother that was in, and he was shipped stateside for a 30 day vacation because they were scheduled to go out to the South Pacific. Now, a lot of people are opposed to the fact that Harry Truman used the two bombs. Mm -hmm. You don't destroy another million Americans, not after what they had done, because theoretically and basically, if there had been no Pearl Harbor, there would have been no atomic bomb. They brought it on themselves. Mm -hmm. I look more like a professor with my hands told them. They tell me I'm Jewish to a degree, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe somewhere down my ancestry. Do you know about anybody Jewish? What's that? Do you know anybody that's Jewish? Jewish? Yeah, they speak with their hands, it's very melodramatic. Mm -hmm. I've heard that. Yeah. So, what other, what other questions? Well, <clears throat> basically, um, where were you when uh, you heard about the death of this, of course this is before the war ended, when you, when you heard about the death of President Roosevelt? Somewhere yeah. in combat. Precisely, I couldn't pinpoint the exact place in Europe, but mm -hmm. we were in combat at the time. Okay. And then a short time after that, the, the war in Europe had ended. Do you recall? May, May 8th, as a matter of fact, we were about 35 kilometers out of Berlin when we got orders to stand. Mm -hmm. They said the Russians were coming in, and they convinced Eisenhower, General Eisenhower, that do not waste any more American lives. We will come in. Of course, Stalin himself was a crude and shrewd general. Mm -hmm. Man, he buttered their peanut butter sandwiches, and man, did he get a big bite out of the deal. I mean, in reality, I'm not a historian. I do like history for what it's worth. I know I put some time into it. I don't feel that I've made history. I was part of history, not that I wanted to be. It's part of the index, part of the context of the story that we're inducing now. But uh, the only thing that ever bothered me was, if I can deviate a little from the conversation, June 6th, after eight and a half months, we managed, and I'll show you some pictures of it, get 33 veterans and the associates get on Southwest Airlines at 5.30 in the morning, fly them out to Washington, D.C., which was 106 degrees temperature, and we spent 17 hours down there. As we were going through, you couldn't land at the uh, Dallas Airport because of the restrictions of the air flight, so we landed at the VWI, which is the Baltimore, Washington International Airport. Then they had to have buses to transport us from the airport to Washington, D.C. for the monument mm -hmm. and the activities. As we were coming through the airport, before we got on the buses to get to Washington, D.C., somebody informed the public that the World War II veterans were coming through. I've never seen a greater appreciation as to what a veteran meant to these people. Mm -hmm. uh, in reality, May 8th, when the war ended in 1945, we were about 30, 35 kilometers out of Berlin. And the fellows that were in New York City all the way to California were the veterans, fortunately, or luckily, were the ones that were embraced, kissed, parlayed, and mm -hmm. what have you. They were the glorified ones. They were stateside, where I still spent another five, five, nine months overseas, occupation. So when we come back, there was none of this fanfare, paper, graffiti. Mm -hmm. So as we're going through this airport, there's a little three-year-old fellow standing down there, and he's saluting the veterans. It was touching. I had a little American flag. I saluted the little fellow with a hand on the flag. He got hold of my hand and he walked all the way down through the airport. To me, it was my glory. Mm -hmm. My thank you.
Okay, and, and you've been involved with the Honor Flight, uh, switching over to that. Do you want to tell us about that program, what it's all about? Well, this started about eight and a half months ago. I've heard about it. Nobody seemed to want to do anything about it. At least nobody in Western New York picked up on it. The state of New York is a big state. A lot of people, a lot of veterans. I uh, read a few articles, had the uh, young lady next door get on a computer, get some information, click on the application, mail the application in eight and a half months ago. Uh, Morris, uh, he took his dad when the memorial was done in 2004, and his father broke down and cried. He says, this meant there's this much to his father. Can you imagine what it means to the other veterans? Some of the other people belonged to the same air group that he belonged to, small Piper Club planes, mm -hmm. and they used to fly the veterans out there until it picked up momentum and more people were interested in it. I understand that there are 30 of the original 50 states that are involved in this honor flight, and they've got 70 or 69 satellites. So as I got the application and inquired about it, Morris wrote me back and he says, I'm glad to hear from you, but he says, Here's what we need you to do. I got the park in here. He says, we'd like to have you set up a satellite. Talk to your various organizations, the AMVETS, the American Legion, Veterans of Foreign Wars. But it just so happens that most of the elderly fellas are already parte, they're gone. The younger fellas make it a social club. I don't want to have this sound as a derogatory remark to them. Uh, they're Korean vets, they're, they're uh, Vietnam vets, you know what I mean? But uh, I had Michelle DeLuca, which is a editorial. As a matter of fact, July 6th, she's got a big article coming out with the pictures. She followed up on this honor flight June 6th and took pictures of the various organizations, the, the soldiers and troops. And uh, she's going to have an article written on that. But she wrote an article, it was small. A few people picked up on it. Got a few calls, that's as far as it went. So I picked up on it, went to see the senator. The senator says, I'm interested in it. He uh, took some literature, some pictures on it, and uh, I understand Judge Vita, he got in on the deal too. That's a problem that people are interested in. Had people calling me asking me, like, if I was Jesus superstar and I could just wave a wand and say to him, get ready and pack your bags, you're flying tomorrow. All it takes is just a simple application. They want the pertinent information. And after they got enough applications, like I said, they wanted to at the time uh, for me to set up a satellite, which means. We'd have to get a president, vice president, the treasurer, and they wanted me to set up an insurance company with $2 million to back up in case anybody gets hurt. Too late in the game for me to play mm -hmm. politics or the man of the magic wand. Mm -hmm. So I, I pursued a few people. Michelle wrote it. She got a hold of uh, Debbie Mellon at the Air Force Base. She picked up on it. We got some corporate backers up on this, and only after eight and a half months, we found that uh, they used the... Uh, what do they call it now? The, uh, when, when you get loans, uh, the, the... Collateral or...? Well, that's, it's collateral. It, it, it's a credit union, basically, because there was no money to back up on it. They had that backing mm -hmm. up on it. They used the Air Force backing from the uh, credit union to get the air flight to get paid for and uh, follow up on all of this. So then we were notified that on June 6th, uh, we were going to fly out of Buffalo Airport. Of course, they had dignitaries down there in the morning. Everybody's out there with a hat on their shoulder. I mean, they're in on the line, you know. Mm -hmm. There's such things as dignitary, and there's such things as just political. Yeah. I mean, if you're a senator, of course, our senator, he surprised me. I've never seen a senator push a wheelchair like this one did. Matter of fact, I got some pictures down here to show you after a while. And uh, it went off fine. I was more than pleased. It was a rough day. It reminded me of the good old days of basic training with a full field pack. But it was something I did for the veterans, not so much for myself. I'm not a honor or a glory man. I feel the 33 that went down there, plus the associates that assisted with the wheelchairs, they're willing to go back. And what we're trying to do is, uh, well, the young lady, she passed out from heat exhaustion, so did the other one. We had lost two or three people. But they tell me out of the original 6,000 applications that were put in across the country, 50 of them that had the applications in. When their time was to travel to Washington, D.C., the good Lord had other plans, and they passed away mm -hmm. society. As a matter of fact, in our trip, of only 33, I think we lost three, that never had a chance to make 
So it's a touch and go situation. Nobody guarantees you that you're going to make it. You know what I mean? The important thing is we got to get the applications out. The more applications they get into Ohio, they're able to pick up down. That's the main headquarters. Then they notify the corporate people here in Western New York and have more satellite people to pick up on. I don't know how many more veterans are left in the state of New York, but if they don't get off their butts, show more enthusiasm, the cake is going to be gone. There'll be no frosting left on it. That's why I'm hoping for your cooperation, courtesy, this gentleman's cooperation. It don't take much to, to produce these. All they have to do is get on a WW, honor flight, or, mm -hmm. and let's get the word out. The more applications we get in, the sooner we get the next flight going on. Because after World War II veterans are gone, they want to have these satellites still function. They want to take them out to see the Korean veteran uh, organizations and the Vietnam organizations. See. Although they do go to see these different organizations and the memorials that are there. But uh, this past Memorial Day, after pursuing all of this in the article you've got down there, the senator just took it upon himself. We figured being that you took so much time and effort and show, showed so much emotion for the veterans. He says, I'd like to designate you as a Grand Marshal for the Memorial Day Parade that we had in the Town of Wonders. It's a political deal, the same token, it's an honor that it's bestowed upon mm -hmm. you. Uh, you live in uh, uh, Saudi or Town? No, no, North Town of Wonders. Oh. And you've got some photographs there to show oh, us? Yes. Picture like Confucius says, one picture is equivalent to what? 10,000 words? This is the uh, plate well, itself. I, I want you to, to hold them up in front of you and, and explain uh, what they are. And I can zoom right in with the camera. Well, these are pictures that were taken by the senator's family. Okay, let me just get a few more here. Okay, and this is, they were taken in Tonawanda? Yeah, North Tonawanda. The okay. two cities combining the Memorial Day Parade together. It hasn't been done for quite a few years. Okay. So the Senator decided we need a little bit of life into this Memorial Day. Okay. So they got the mayor of North Tonawanda and the mayor from town of Tonawanda. Had him get into the parade. They led the parade. The gold, mother, gold star mothers. The only thing I found extraordinary was the Senator's wife drove the convertible. He walked behind with his family, and they had me as an honor grand marshal for riding in the front seat. Okay. And uh, you want to hold up the, the next group and explain well, them? Well, these are some of the marshals, the colored guard, flag bearers. Okay. I see, you, I, see you, I see you get difficulty even uh, focusing, which I mean to you that as far as I'm concerned, it, it's not very important. This is nothing more but another reproduction of the color guard, the honor guard. Okay. Uh, this is after the parade is over. This is the podium where they had the gold star mothers take the flower, put it down by the wall of merit. And they had a dignitary there from the Navy, which they had a cannon fired at 6.30 in the morning between both cities for the Navy and, and the uh, Seabees. Okay. And then actually the two mayors had a speech in regards to the Veterans Memorial and the okay. Memorial War that's behind. Of course, they asked me for commentary. I was not. This, this is the uh, picture at the podium. This is the senator with his family financial backing. That's okay. a state senator, isn't it? Right, Senator Mazur. Okay. Let me kind of stash this away a little bit. I uh, intend not to keep. What I intend to do is, uh, I've got a granddaughter right now, as a matter of fact, she's in high school, she goes to Catholic school. She is. Uh, in Washington, D.C. now, interested in some intelligence and all with the uh, colleges there. 
and it's more or less making a uh, log Um, something I forgot to ask you, Harry. Uh, yes. Uh, when were you discharged from the Army? Discharged the last day of 45. As a matter of fact, on New Year's Day, we were riding from Camp Atterbury to uh, Michigan to the Mack Trunk Railroad Station. And there was a feeling that uh, was pretty hard to digest due to the fact that we'd almost gone for three and a half years. Having your family meet you at the train. It's a different emotion, a different feeling. Now, did the rest of your family members make it home all right from the service? Uh, fortunately, the oldest brother is deceased. As a matter of fact, he's only stateside about two years when he was confronted with an aneurysm. Of course, you're familiar oh. with an aneurysm. Sure. Uh, the neurosurgeon that uh, wrote two or three books on his particular case, in the case of the veterans that came back, they didn't know whether he was born with the aneurysm, whether it was because of bombing and concussion to the brain. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first time they brought him in, they uh, shaved his head, cut two parts like you do in the water mill. And after they opened him up, they found out it was more or less something that was exploratory. They couldn't do much. They sewed him back up. Six months later, they took him back to the Venice Hospital. All they could do was give him sodium pentothal. He was conscious most of the time, just give him local. And cut a skull cap from ear to ear, and just lay the whole skull cap. And I think he lay down there for about 10 to 12 hours while the doctors were analyzing and diagnosed. Uh, they figured if they were going to put sleeve in the main artery, he would have had a cerebral hemorrhage while he was on the table. So all they could do was sew him up. The only wonderful thing about it was, what is the left side that controls the speech? I think so. Yeah, and I think the right side is, interferes with your speech. The mind was sharp even after all the surgery. Of course, being that the pressure was there, they had to have perform surgery back on his throat, put a sleeve on that. Of course, because of the pressure, his tongue deviated, he had difficulty speaking. The eye had to build up with a mucus that they had a wash in. You can't go shot you get some foreign matter into it. The ear drum. He's going through hell for almost 50 years. As a matter of fact, it's about 10 years, it's going to be 11 years this November that he passed away. And after being in England for five years, like I say, he went through L2 because of the V1s, V2s, and uh, all the bombers, the crews that he was familiarized with, they lost. So I think they've got over 2,000, uh, no, was it 24,000, if I'm not mistaken, of the Air Force that uh, they lost. There's a tremendous amount of the Air Force. In fact, like that one bomb raid they made, I mean, what they lost, 60 uh, bombers on that ball bearing mm -hmm. raid that they had, 10 to a bomber, six, uh, 600. Uh, Air Force personnel. Yep. Uh, oh, where were we? You were. That's enough of the parade. So they decided for me to go to the uh, Washington Memorial. And they had me act as the honorary then in representing New York State in the memorial. And they had me put the flower on and salute the memorial if you wish to give a picture. Yep. Okay. One has received it. Of course, there's another one if you want to make it this way. Oh, I got it upside down. Oh. I wonder if the veteran's confused. Okay. Of course, there's an awful lot of pictures down here. The Iwo Jima Memorial, Senator Doyle, Washington Monuments, a few buddies that were there. I don't think you want to control with those, do you? Oh, you can hold a couple of them up if you like, sure. Well, I know they got the Pentagon building where they bombed and blew it up. You don't want to see, you want to see that? Sure. It's a different color there because they had to renovate it. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Of course, this is a Air Force Museum Memorial. Let me see something more important. Uh, this is Senator Doyle, and this is a fellow you're going to probably interview tomorrow, which is Jeff Zedita. Jeff Zedita is on the extreme uh, left of the picture. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. All right. 
you recall seeing Jim Sedita in Lyme? Yes. I'd like to have been there with him. Uh, this is part of the memorial as you come down and see it. Okay. This is the Iwo Jima Memorial. I think I got a larger one than that. We'll let this save that for the larger one. And I can show you instead of the small one. It was most interesting. Of course, something I found out about the Lincoln Memorial was I never knew that uh, they had an elevator to take you up on top. Were you aware of the fact? Oh, no. No. And uh, one other thing that I appreciated more than anything else was they had an air-conditioned laboratory at the very base of the memorial. Mm -hmm. It's a 106 degree temperature, let me tell you. Most facilities go to the little boys' room for about almost a quarter, three quarters of a mile. It's a very embarrassing situation when you don't have all the... Uh, mm -hmm. The one that's really spooky is this one here. That's the Corian Memorial. Have you ever seen that one? No. I've seen pictures of it. You'd swear in reality these are spirits. Sometimes you wonder they're not real. You can almost see them move. Okay. See that one? Yeah. I've seen that pictures one? of it. Okay. Um, Harry, what? Uh, have you joined any veterans organizations at all, besides the Honor, honor I, Flight? I belong to the uh, AMVETS, American Legion, Veterans of Foreign Wars. But, uh, like I say, the old troops are falling to the wayside. Like mm -hmm. old uh, General MacArthur said, old soldiers don't die, they just fade away. Mm -hmm. And in reality, as you were saying, when we were supposed to liberate Paris, France, if I may add on to it, General de Gaulle, you're familiar with him, asked the Americans if he could have the privilege of liberating his own big city of Paris. The American troops were held back. The French soldiers were told to advance and liberate Paris. Of course, Adolf himself wanted to burn Paris. You're familiar with that. That's history. Mm -hmm. I'm not a historian, but there are certain things that are still within the mind. Mm -hmm. And this one great gentleman was appreciative of the fact of what Paris was like and what it represented and what it meant did not destroy Paris within. But anyway, as our troops were held back because we were not allowed into Paris, the French troops were told to go in and liberate Paris. The Mademoiselles, I shouldn't use this word, supposedly douched and redouched himself after the German soldiers pulled out because their French soldiers were coming in to liberate. And for two days, you couldn't see a soldier in Paris. They whined and dined him. If you know what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. Liberté, huh? Tell Eisenhower said, hey, that city is not protected, it's not covered. That's when we got orders to move in, cover Paris. Like I say, I regret there isn't more of a group sitting at the table and you discuss it where you bring in things that one may overlook or one may add something to it, you know what I mean? It's more interesting, like an encyclopedia. If you only get one chapter, that's all the knowledge you have. But if you got the full volume, you got all the reference that you can fall back onto. Your quotes, the formulas, the associations, the encounters, the meanings of things. I know I wasn't really prepared for this. These are the things just momentarily in the mind that I'm bringing out. This young man here had his paperwork. He was well prepared for it. I was going to call in after being as of 5 o'clock this morning for my scan and everything else, and they had you on 24-hour fasting. Mm -hmm. and they give you this berry. I feel like I ate four turkeys and two steaks. Not that it's food in this. The berry and mm -hmm. evolving. And And uh, literally, if I wanted the glory and the fame that comes with it, I would spend more time with the secretary, with Kathleen, making notes, that's the proper way to do it. Mm -hmm. Or in reality, come with the five W's of journalism man would. Well, you did, a, you did a fine job. Well, not in reality as to what I really had in mind to bring up. But uh, this one here is a picture I think you enjoy. This I just picked up at the Tanawanda News yesterday. 
course, this cost me 10 because the photographers now are getting into a business. They uh, do not give you a uh, computer printer, which is newspaper. Mm -hmm. If you want a finished copy, there's a little chance to do make a little bit of dough ring me. Capisce poi mai Do you understand the English language? How many languages do you compete? Just barely English. <laughs> Queen's English? Mm -hmm. Now, he's going to be glad to get this. I'm going to give it to him. I need this now. You can see the photographer. You know who he favored, don't you? Does that tell you anything? Sure. Does that tell you anything? Mm -hmm. What do you see on it? You, can, you don't recognize me there, do you? Well, I think you're the one who's sitting in the convertible there. <laughs> well. All right. Well, thank you, Harry. You are pity. The large ones. Right, the memorials. Okay. Yep, pull them up. Let's see. Okay. You will. Jima. Yep. Okay. Got it. All right. Of course, this is the large one here, too, of uh, presenting the brief on the memorial. Okay. And uh, this is saluting the soldiers in their surroundings. Okay. This one again is the big Iwo Jima with all the veterans at the bottom. And that is Earl Morris, the founder of the organization or the group that's interested in the honor fight. Okay. And this one is the photographer from the town of one knows figured let's bring some of your youth back. Why don't you just sit down like a little boy that goes fishing at the fountain and let your mind relax and see what pleasantries you can receive to bring back home. Okay. Did he? All right, thank you. Right on. Nothing else.